but even listening to the song that we just sung, and again referencing back to, to Josh's prayer about taking the light to, to the world around us, and even the song we just sang, I'll sing and tell his story. It's just amazing how many of our prayers and how many of the songs we actually sing, we vocalize and uh, confirm that we are to be bearing witness to the truth and we are to be ministers of reconciliation to the lost world around us. In number 616, it's the name of, uh, the song is the is Into Our Hands. And I just want you to listen to these words. And I think it kind of, it, it pricks my heart as I think about the words of this song and, and think about my life and the, the degree of neglect that I've given to looking and creating opportunities for telling people about Jesus. Swiftly, we're turning Life's daily pages. Swiftly the hours are changing to years. How are we using God's golden moments? Shall we reap glory? Shall we reap tears? Millions are groping without the gospel. Quickly they'll reach eternity's night. Shall we sit idly as they rush onward? Haste, let us hold up Christ the true light. Souls that are precious, souls that are dying, while we rejoice, our sins are forgiven. Did he not also die for these lost ones? Then let us point the way unto heaven. Into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message. Guiding the erring back to the right. You know, recently I've been listening through a series uh, of a preacher who is well known for evangelism and he does a series every once in a while where he goes and does a gospel meeting it's like six parts on um, helping congregations prepare for for teaching the lost and having conversations and creating opportunities it's kind of interesting just thinking about the words of this song it's kind of interesting he says the place he always starts is the book of ecclesiastes because he says everybody in the world identifies with the book of ecclesiastes and it's true we're all searching and our searches, searches uh, for, for fulfillment and the things of this life, they all come up empty. The only conclusion by the end of it we can come to is that we were made for a purpose, and it is to live God's purpose. Everybody's searching whether they'll acknowledge that Jesus is the answer or not. It's up to them, but everybody can relate to the book of Ecclesiastes because everybody's searching. And then at verse number two, millions are groping without the gospel. And quickly they'll reach eternity's night. He says the greatest success that he's had is beginning with the book of Ecclesiastes. And the fact that he had success beginning with that book just emphasizes there are a lot of people out there looking. I think we go into the idea of evangelism, evangelism just assuming that nobody wants to hear what we have to say. They're just going to write us off. They're just going to put us off and it's not going to do any good. But he has the most success with the book of Ecclesiastes because the reality is that it does do good. When it falls on the right heart and God gives the increase, it does do good. Millions are groping, and into our hands the gospel has been given. Fear is a self-imposed prison that keeps us from becoming who God wants us to be. We must move against it with the weapons of fear, faith, and love. I want to talk for just a few moments about fighting fear with fear in the context of evangelism. That's our context this morning. We're talking about 1 Peter and how to truly live as exiles and make a difference as exiles. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, he introduces us to this idea, Jesus does, that, we, that, that fear is, is, is how you fight fear. Uh, in the context of, of living the life of Christ, we overcome the fear of the world by fearing God. In verse 26, as he's, prepared his, as he's prepared his apostles for being sent out, he's prepared them for the fact that persecution is going to come. In verse 16, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. <coughs> Excuse me, I apologize. <coughs> I choked on my own breath, I think. <coughs> and Jesus went, <coughs> excuse me. Behold, I am sending you out in the sh as sheep in the midst of wolves. My wife's not, you're not going to hear her quit laughing until the end. This is all over. <clears throat> Give me just a second. <clears throat> no, thank you. <clears throat> Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. <clears throat> 
to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. In verse 24, notice that he connects a disciple to the teacher. He connects those who are his to his own manner of living, uh, reminding us of what Jesus has already said, a servant is not above his master. But in verse 26, this is what I want us to consider this morning. Have no fear of them, <clears throat> for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, <clears throat> but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fail, fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than the sparrows. <clears throat> so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. What does he say? He says, fight fear with fear. Don't be imprisoned by the fear of man. Man can only do so much to you. Man cannot touch who you truly are. Only God can do that. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He says, fight fear with fear. We prepare ourselves for evangelism, and that's the context here, talking about the sending out of the apostles. We prepare ourselves for evangelism not by doing away with fear, but by redirecting it. To the proper place. We think about the fear of the Lord and, and all that that involves and what that means. Yeah, we talk about the hatred of evil. Yes, we talk about practically speaking what that looks like. And a lot of times is, is, is pondering the paths of our feet. Proverbs 4, because Proverbs 5, we know that he's pondering the path of our feet, that God is doing that. But what role does fear have in the life of the Christian or the exile, especially in the context of evangelism? Well, if you look there in, in 1 Peter chapter 1... Go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want you to notice what, what Peter writes there in verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 17, he says, If you call him his father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. You're like, I know, we've been talking about that. Conduct yourselves with fear. But what I read first, the intro to that statement gives us a cause for fear. It's the fear of knowing that God will judge us impartially. That's what's going to happen. Each one of us will face that one day. We will stand before God Almighty and we will receive a judgment that is impartial. It's not based on how we compare to the person next to us or the person behind us. He will hold the word of God up and he will judge us by what is written. How we live, how we walked, how we conducted ourselves throughout the period of our exile. And so... Fighting the fear that suppresses and imprisons is actually simply the idea of redirecting it to, to God who has all control and all power. And because of the knowledge of what's going to happen and what is happening, we're released from all the other fear. And we are prepared to be free in Christ and we are prepared to make a difference and we are prepared to become who God wants us to be. Because we have the fear of knowing that God the Father will judge us impartially. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to venture out just a little bit. Hebrews chapter 10, we have the fear of falling away, of the outcome of falling away. If we choose to stop walking by the conduct of the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 29, we have the fear of trampling underfoot the Son of God. Verse 26, if we go on sinning deliberately. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26, after receiving the knowledge of the truth... There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who's trampled underfoot the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? In outrage, the Spirit of grace, we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He goes on in the rest of the chapter to say, look, you've, you've not thrown away your confidence to this point. But don't do it going forward. 
He says, keep your confidence. You have great need of it. Verse 35, you have, uh, if, don't throw it away because, because your confidence has a great reward. You have need of endurance. The one who shrinks back, verse 38, my soul has no pleasure of him, but you as an exile, as a Christian, as an adopted child of God, verse 39, by, by, by your very nature, you are not going to be one of those who shrink back. If you walk the faith, you won't shrink back. Don't let that happen to you. Don't be destroyed. But be one who walks by faith and preserves their souls. Fighting fear with fear involves the fear of actually regressing from the conduct of the Christian. Of Hebrews chapter 2, drifting away, right, from the salvation that's been revealed. The last thing we want to do is take the most precious and valuable gift we've ever been given and profane it by treating it as something that's not as valuable or not as cherishable as it truly is. The last thing we want to do is to stop living our lives as living sacrifices for the Lord. I, um, in, in, in this past week, we considered the idea of, of what it means to get on the altar and lay down and give all of what, who we are to God to be a living sacrifice. The last thing we want to do is to climb off the altar. And so fighting the fear of the world is going to encompass redirecting that fear towards God, knowing that he will judge us impartially. It is profanity in trampling underfoot the Son of God to turn back to our old way of living. It involves the fear of not being knowledge, acknowledged before our Father. We just read that, right, in, Hebrew, in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, following, don't fear those who kill the body, but fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. In verse 32, Jesus says, everyone who acknowledges me before me, and I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. I, I think oftentimes we, 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 we assume that silence is not a denial, but silence is not acknowledgement. Therefore, science, silence is a denial. <coughs> are we speaking the name of the Lord? Jesus says we need to live with the idea and the understanding that if we are not acknowledging the name of the Lord, and that involves a putting something out there, not just a getting rid of something, he's not going to acknowledge us. If we won't speak his name, he won't speak ours. And so part of the actual process of preparing as exiles to be engaged in making a difference in the world around us and telling people what they desperately need to know is, is taking our eyes off of things that in the eyes of the world would cause great fear and putting it on the thing that in actuality should cause the greatest. In Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, in verse 35, Jesus looks at the masses of people, and he sees in verse 35 that they were harassed and helpless. Verse 36, he looked at the crowds coming, and he says they look, it says that he looked at them, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. They, had, they didn't know which way to go. They were lost. They were helpless and hopeless. The reaction of Jesus in verse 36 was not, oh, well, they just, they're just going to get what they deserve. I mean, that's just the life that they chose. And so I'm just going to mind my own business. I'm going to go do my own thing. After all, I'm saved. No, it says he had compassion for them. As sheep without a shepherd, he desired to be the shepherd that they sought. He had compassion for them. And he turned and he looked at his disciples in verse 37. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Laborers are few. Therefore pray, earn, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. I don't think the situation has changed. I don't think it has. I think there's a lot of people who are out there seeking. We have visitors from time to time, and obviously those visitors are seeking something. We have people who are tuning in and, and, and going on the website and, and, and listening to sermons. And every once in a while, we'll get phone calls or we'll get emails of people and kind of weed through them a little bit. And you find in the midst of the, the mass, one or two that are searching. The 
harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There are a lot of people out there who are lost, but who are in the search of the book of Ecclesiastes. They're in the heart of it. They're in the thick of it. They're actively looking for something that gives their life meaning and fulfillment. And into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Okay, so let us carry God's precious message, guiding the erring, back to the light. I tell you what, I'm ready to get busy. I am. I want to look for opportunities. I want to create opportunities. I want to find ways to reach people in ways that I have not been doing. If you look over in Matthew chapter 20, in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 3, Excuse me, let me just go ahead and begin in verse 1. Matthew chapter 20, the kingdom of heaven is like a master of the house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for Daenerys today, he sent them out to his vineyard. And going out the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too. Whatever's right, I'll give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing I'm not going to read the entirety of this passage, but ultimately, you've read this before, by the end of it, everyone gets the same wages. People are not happy about this. But in verse 15, the master says, Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now, now I would... <clears throat> I would contend that most likely this, this parable of a sort probably has some connection to Jews and Gentiles, those who came before and those who came later. But I couldn't help but thinking about this story in connection with what we just read in Matthew chapter 9 about the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. And just kind of thinking in this passage, what part would I have, would I have played just in this story as an illustration? And, and, and I hope that I wouldn't be playing the part of the idle person standing. That's not the part that I want to play. I want to be the person who's at work. I want to be the person who's going and is, is, is doing and is seeking and looking and encouraging and in teaching and, and building up. I want to be the person who is at work. And I think in order for me to get motivated to do that, one of the things that's going to happen is that I'm going to have to move beyond just fearing God for myself, but into the realm of fearing God for others. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes a, a, another letter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, if you'll look over there for just a second, beginning in verse 8, 2 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 8, this is what we look forward to, right? This is the day that we know is coming. And it does cause fear to the extent that verse 11 says, when you consider how the world's going to be destroyed, here's what you should take away from it. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? That's the, that's the end that, that Peter is trying to inspire by reminding these people of the day of the Lord. You be a person of holiness and godliness. Don't be caught off guard doing things that don't fit who you are in Christ Jesus. But I want to read verses 8 through 10. 8 through 10. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done on it will be Exposed. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen on the day of the Lord, is that all that we know that is physical is going to be burned up. It's going to be destroyed. But verse 9 highlights the fact that the Lord's not quickly bringing this about. His promise is going to come true, but the delay is simply for the benefit of those who are still on the earth. He is being patient. He doesn't wish that any should perish. His desire is that all should reach repentance. Now, ultimately, that patience is going to run out. And that's going to come on a day that you and I have no idea. Like a thief in the night, it says, at a day and an hour that nobody knows, we will be surprised. But in the meantime, let's take advantage of the patience of God. And use the opportunity that he's given to increase and to draw nearer. 
And if we need to reach for repentance to do that, but I want to just highlight from this text that God's patience towards me, God's patience towards me is also God's patience towards others. And that God's desire for me is also God's desire for others. And so though I may be doing the best that I can do today as a Christian, there is someone next to me somewhere who needs to have the love of God in Christ Jesus made known to them. Maybe God has been patient with them in order to bring them to you. If the greatest gift man can know is salvation in Christ, then evangelism is our greatest gift to the dying world. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. How amazing is it to read that pas passage and to know that you own that, that Jesus gave that to you. You are a recipient of that. You are the redeemed. You are the reconciled. You are an adopted child of God. By his mercy, you have been born again. You are living with a living hope. You, you know that Jesus was raised from the dead. You know that you're going to be raised from the dead one of these days. And there's going to be inheritance that will never pass away. What an amazing, amazing thought. The greatest gift that we could ever know is salvation in Christ Jesus. And therefore, the greatest gift we could ever give is salvation in Christ Jesus. God saved us, 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 9. And we who were not a people, verse 10, are now God's people. And we who had not received mercy have now received mercy. So what does verse 9 say? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God saved us so that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness. Yes, yes, we may suffer along the way. We will meet lots of opposition. There will be a many people who do not like the message we carry. But that's okay, they didn't like the message Jesus carried either. And to this you have been called, chapter 2 and in verse 21. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. When he... But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Yes, we may suffer, but Christ suffered for us. Therefore, we must, like Paul, not be ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We must not be ashamed. Yes, there will always be opposition declaring the gospel will always be met with it. It will always come with a cost. But we cannot let that be the object of our Fear In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 16, Elisha and his servant in the land of Dothan, they were surrounded by the enemies. The servant comes out and he's just, I mean, he's just besides himself. But Elisha comes out, he calms him down, and he says, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I don't know what kind of opposition you and I might face if we get vocal about this. But in all circumstances, and regardless of the outcome, the one who is with us is far greater than the one who is with the world. 
And so even in the face of opposition, we must shine our lights. You are the light of the world. We must season our corner of the world. You are the salt of the earth. In Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 8, when these people were preaching the way of Christ before Paul's conversion, he comes and he's just, just throwing people in prison and, and giving testimony to have them put to death. In chapter 8, uh, Saul approves of the ex execution of Stephen and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Okay, uh, we mentioned in our first lesson that 1 Peter deals more with soft persecution, right? Being maligned, being excluded, kind of harassed and, uh, and inconvenienced in a way. Okay, these people are dealing with what we call hard persecution. And in verse 4 it says, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. They went about preaching. And what's interesting is we read throughout the New Testament that the universal church, by locality, became local congregations that were representations of the full body. And they came together on the first day of the week and regularly they were meeting together in Acts chapter 2. It, it was, it's kind of this pattern of we must regroup on a weekly basis, get our bearings about ourselves, encourage one another, and then we leave this place and we scatter on mission, just like in Acts chapter 8. We scatter and we go about preaching the word, being the light of the earth, being the light of the world and the salt of the earth, shining, seasoning, regrouping, and scattering again to start it all over. Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> it's this passage on anxiety and it's talking about do not be anxious about what you'll wear, what you'll eat, um, all of these kinds of things because your heavenly father knows that you need these, need all of these things. But um, we could easily replace that with things that become the themes throughout the book of 1 Peter. Don't be anxious about fame. Don't be anxious about fortune. Don't be anxious about material possessions. Don't be anxious about being liked by everybody. Don't be anxious about the thought of being outcast. Don't be anxious about the thought that people may hate you, ridicule you, and malign you. You just seek first the kingdom of God, and the rest will take care of itself. You just, you just teach. You just tell people about Jesus. Do not fear opposition from man. Redirect your fear to the one who's worthy, our God Almighty. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 26 again, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. I'm going to read to you an excerpt. Uh, I read, there's a book that I read, and it kind of got me thinking along the lines of 1 Peter and some of these themes, and uh, there's, there's a section in there called Preaching Scared, and he tells about an experience where he goes to another country, and he's, he's doing it as a, a missionary, he's preaching the word of God, and he said he walked in to where he was worshiping at the time, and to the one who was preaching at that small <coughs> local congregation of about 30, and he said on his desk was his Bible, and he said... The Bible had a bullet hole in it. He said, I never, uh, he, he doesn't expound on how that happened. He doesn't give any explanation, but that was the first impression he got of this new place. But there was a weekend or a Saturday, I believe, I believe the Saturday, I, I don't know, I need to go back and check that detail. But one morning, the preacher was there and he was there at the building and there was a, a ruckus outside and he goes out and there were men waiting for him. And because of the message that he preached and how the community did not like it, this was in another country somewhere, they just beat the fire out of him. Well, the next morning, when everyone arrived for worship, of course, he was there and he was ready to preach. And he looked rough, but he was there. It says, I'm going to read this to you. By the time our worship began, nerves 
seemed to have settled a bit after what had happened that weekend. We all took our places, including the preacher, sitting in his usual seat. The service opened with prayer and song, and about halfway through the time of worship, a group of three men entered the back door. We had visitors. In much of the world today, having visitors means something totally different from what it does in our context. The whole situation can be quite tricky. Are they friendly? Are they terrorist? So whoever it is, you greet them with a smile and fervent prayer. But this particular day, we were especially on edge. I remember how as three men sat directly behind my wife and three kids, a million scenarios raced through my mind. My throat tightened while I voiced the words of the hymn. When other members slowly turned to notice the guests, tension clouded the room, but I could also tell that the preacher still didn't know they were there. As the final song came to a close, our preacher stood and approached the front. He opened his Bible, turned and looked up, and he saw them. We all noticed him, noticed them. No one knew what would happen next. What, if anything, would the strangers do? How would he respond? What were we to do? After an initial pause that seemed like ages, the preacher launched into his sermon. To this day, I don't know what he had prepared to preach that Sunday, but his topic shifted. With trembling in his voice, he immediately spoke of Christ and the gospel, his death and resurrection and the need for all people to repent and believe. His tone was forceful, his eyes locked to the congregation, and I sensed his gaze focused past my brow and directly to our visitors. He had taken inventory of the fear in the room and decided to stock the shelves with an even greater fear, the coming judgment of God. His spirit-filled boldness was amazing. You know, it's interesting when you read, to, read in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, I want to conclude with this as our last verse. Acts chapter 9. I want you to notice what happened in the early church. <clears throat> Saul had just been converted. Don't you imagine the tension in the room on this day was just as high? He'd been throwing people in prison giving testimony at their trials in order to have them arrested. He, he comes back and talks about that later on. He comes in verse 26 to try to join the disciples at Jerusalem. Yeah, of course, they're afraid of him. They didn't believe he was a disciple. They thought he was there as a terrorist. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord and spoke to him, and how at Damascus he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. He went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Notice this verse 1. This is what I want you to see. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. It multiplied because they were walking in the fear of the Lord. They were taking their comfort from the Holy Spirit. And regardless of what hap was happening or what might happen as a product of what they would speak, they spoke. And it multiplied. It's not enough to merely be exiles. We must be exiles on mission. And I hope that we can talk about ways that we can do that and effectively do that as we seek to reach Conway and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. I'm going to conclude with a quote that I have had on my wall for a long time and haven't listened to it enough until here just recently and want to do better at listening to the wisdom of this. I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. The something that I ought to do, I can do, and by the grace of God, I will. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, Help us to be lights of the world and salt of the earth. 
to value every single day and never forget the price that was paid for our sins, Father. We have a home in heaven with you, and we're, we are anxious to get there, Father. Help us to strive every day to press on towards that upward call through Christ Jesus. To keep the hope of glory ever before us, Father, to realize this world's not our home. But, Father, we're not merely just passing through. You've given us a mission along the way. Father, you've, you've called us to be ministers of reconciliation. To share the joy that we enjoy with those who do not yet enjoy it. Father, help us to see everyone around us as those who you lovingly and fearfully made in your very image, but are captive to their sins and to death and desperately need saving, Father, and to see ourselves as those who have the hands that hold the answer. Father, help us to be intentional, proactive, diligent. Help us to not fear things that are temporary. Father, help us to walk in the fear of you and help us to have the fear of you for others as well. Father, embolden us and give us courage and give us confidence and give us strength through Jesus Christ so that in all of life's circumstances like Paul, we might learn to be content and that we might not relent from the message that you have given us to speak. <coughs> Father, I pray for your blessings on us as we seek to be that light. I pray for your blessings on this church as we seek to do the same. Father, that not only we might be built up always, but that your kingdom might multiply both here and all around the world. Father, please bless your church in all places around this world. That each church may do its work in its own place. And that we might see the world changed for the good. You are a good and a gracious God and we praise your name. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. Please forgive us where we have sinned. And help us to stand up and walk confidently before you, walking in faith, fear, and in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe is there someone here to, this morning who is not yet a child of God? The invitation is yours this morning. Now, we've examined some of the things that, that you might need to consider, but especially there from Second Peter. God's being patient. His desire for you is repentance. He wants you to come to life. He wants to give you life. He wants you to live a blessed life here, but he wants to bless you in eternity, in the place of eternal glory. And if you are here and you're ready to respond to him, to give your life to him, and to walk in that way of the blessed hope, will you confess that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Will you change your life to live the life he's called you to live as a new creature? Will you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? Will you be faithful? To walk before him in the spirit all the days of your life and live by his word and his way of holiness. If so, then the entrance to the eternal kingdom will be yours to walk through. And not only that, but he will consider it a joy to present you in splendor to the Father. If you're here this morning and you are subject to the gospel in any way, won't you let us know by coming forward as we stand and sing.